Hang on. Oh, okay. I think they he hear it. It was just switched off. Fools. Uh, now it's off again. Okay. Now okay. it's on. Okay. Okay. It's on. I think, I think we're on. Yeah. Yeah. We're definitely on now. People said we're good. Hello, everyone. So for the last minute I just talked, we should cut this to this point now. Welcome to the Wisewell Show with Mike Rosehart. You guys can see. Perfect. Okay. He's on the phone just verifying. So you guys can hear me now loud and clear, hopefully. Welcome to the Wise Wall Show. I do have a bit of a cold, so forgive me if I have to cough. Uh, unfortunately, during the live filmings I just did, not live, pre-recorded filmings I just did, uh, during the last two videos, I did do a bit of coughing. We'll try to edit that out as best we possibly can. Really excited. One of the videos subscribers have been begging me for is how do you sell the dream of early retirement to your spouse? How do you sell the dream of frugality to your significant other or to your parents or to your friends? How do you get them to understand the retire early movement, the fire movement? So that's going to be a really good video talking about the four stages. You know, the first is ignorance, annoyance. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through all that yet, but eventually you get to acceptance. And that's the whole point is that the video talks about getting you through that and some really cool strategies to get your partner on board. It's not a quick thing. It's going to take time, but I'll share how I did it and how you guys can do it too. So that's a cool video. And then we just did one on the Canadian real estate market as well. I don't want to steal the thunder of that. So don't ask me too many questions about the data, but I was looking at some reports on Toronto, Vancouver, Canadian house prices in general, affordability indexes, as well as some other data around the inverted uh, yield curve. And so I read a bunch of that and then just did a live video. And I should have actually just filmed my screen because I botched a ton of the stats probably. Like I think I just paused for like three seconds to think about a stat. If I just had it in front of me, it would have been much smoother and smarter. But Hindsight's 2020. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video because I talk in there about how to invest smartly for cash flow. Mike trying to get that interact, interactive in the comments. Yeah, 100%. That's right. This video, so one of the feedback I got from the live stream segment is people like when I can get the questions answered right away. There's way more value when I do that. So I might try and build a queue with Kyle and then hit the questions right away as they come. I'll give you a quick answer. And then try, just try to keep up with the chat. But if you know, if I get bogged down, I'm just going to try to jump down to the bottom every once in a while and hit a question. Maybe every other question I'll go down and then go back up. And that way, a viewer jumps in and asks a question. They don't wait 20 minutes for an answer. So we'll try to do that to make this stream more engaging. As you guys know, I like and heart and read every single comment. I have thousands of comments on my YouTube channel. And I have liked and read every single one of them. In fact, I've had haters jump on. And I've had like 30 comment arguments where I eventually actually won the hater over in almost every situation. They're like, you know what? I can't argue at that point. Damn. And it's just like, end. that for me is so satisfying. Of course, a huge waste of time. That's what YouTube can be for you. If you're looking to create a YouTube channel to create passive income, don't. If you're looking to create a YouTube channel to share what you have with the world and expect to lose a little bit of money and make a dollar an hour, but give back to the fire community, or whatever it is you want to share about, you know, maybe you do construction videos and you want to show people how to build sheds or whatever. That's a good use, right? Don't go into YouTube for the money. Like one in a thousand, make it to Graham Stephan level, make it to PewDiePie level, make it all the way to the top where, where some of the big players are. I obviously am striving towards that. I have a unique story. I think that's pretty much my only competitive advantage. And I try hard. Like I'm a try hard at the end of the day. I spend a lot of hours working on the SEO and the thumbnails and Kyle, we work together on this. We've been working a lot of hours and that's what it is. It doesn't come right away. Unfortunately, it takes time. And you know, one of our most recent videos, you guys saw it's got like 6,300 views. I think we've, I've started to figure out the algo, I think, to get 10,000 views on a video. I don't know how to get a million views on a video yet. I don't know what that is. I think our thumbnail game needs to be more clickbaity or something. Um, Erica says, that's a true mic drop. <laughs> Because we dropped the mic. Yeah, yeah. That was too good. Um, hit that like button. That's right, guys. Ryan Larson, good to see you on. Tagger Rocks, appreciate you being on and jumping in the comments. William, good to see you on as well, William. Uh, DW, good to see you on. Jonas, of course, good to see you on. Live and Breathe Real Estate. Sup, good to see you on as well. Loving the Instagram uh, stories. I watch those you know, pretty much every other day. So those are pretty, pretty good. They're on my like, top 50 that I watch. Uh, what else? Uh, who else is on, on here? If I missed anyone, I'm sorry, just comment again. Brian Larson, if I missed you, good to see you on as well. H Metal Mosh says, hey Mike. Hey, how's it going? Brian asks, do you use HELOCs when you invest or do you stick 
to cash out refis. <coughs> hey, I guess you guys haven't seen my, is this the first time you guys have seen my haircut? It's a bit ratty, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, we, we had some trouble with this haircut. Elise and I, I fixed it a bit, but it's, it was a brutal haircut, I'll be honest. I had like some alfalfa back here like this long, just hanging out, and I was like, oh damn. So I got the scissors and like cut at the back and try to sculpt it. It's admittedly not my best haircut, but the best part is I haven't paid for a haircut in like three years. Who else can say that? Frugal. Kyle can say that. I'm sure many of my subscribers who subscribe to the frugal mindset and frugality mindset can say the same thing. Uh, so I hope you guys get on board with that. At the same time, I can understand the arguments for going to a barber to look better than this. This is not obviously, you know, barber quality, but at the end of the day... But eventually your skills grow to where you are a barber. There you go. <laughs> not that I want to be a barber, but <laughs> it is fun. You know, at the end of the day, That's one of those pockets I, people argue time, right? The, this is the number one argument I get is like, oh, well, I would never do that because it wastes too much time. My time is too valuable. And I'm like, you know, I walk downstairs, put on a robe and cut, like put on something to collect the hair. We cut the hair, you know, Lisa does the parts that I can't get to. And we work together, we tag team it. And we cut the hair in like 30 minutes. It takes me 20 minutes to drive to the hair salon, wait in line for 20 minutes. Then I have to get a haircut, then I have to tip like a huge amount. Then I have to get back in my car, drive all the way home, waste gas, waste time. So dumb. It's gonna take you like three times as long. So I can't see the argument for saving time unless you just didn't want to learn how to cut hair, yeah. which it takes like a half hour YouTube video. Unless you live beside a barber. If you're a dude, you have no excuse. Like a buzzer could like cut anyone's, That's any dude's hair. That's what I do. That's all I do. <laughs> I use the Floby for cutting hair. I don't even know what the Floby is, Eric. That's, he loves it, he loves the Floby. Someone should tell me what the flow be. We should like bring this up. I wish I had a screen share right now. I could just bring up the flow be. Like the flow be 5,000. Just like comes out like beautiful locks. Like, yes. <laughs> Run it through your hair. Like, Live and breathe real estate. Thanks, Mike. Big follower over here. Continue to follow your journey. Awesome. Thanks. Wow. So the flow be hooks up to a vacuum. That's next level. That would save like 15 minutes every haircut. And I do four haircuts a year. So that would save me like almost an hour. Yeah. I, I, I can understand that. Worth thinking. Tiger Rock just doesn't cut the hair ever. Just lets it grow down all the way. That's my brother's solution too. Matthew McClure dropped a comment, but I lost it because it said message attracted. So I'm not sure what he said. Let me hear in the comments what you said. Good or bad, I want to hear it. Definitely looking forward to connecting soon. Yeah, 100%. OREC, uh, I guess check out the Ontario Real Estate Conference. Uh, OREC's the second time. It happened last year. It's happening again this year. So second annual. Matt McKeever and uh, Jeff Weibo are putting that on. It's Matt McKeever's baby. He calls it like his, his wedding or something. I think last time he called it that. Um, so it's going to be a good event. I think he's going to put a lot of time and energy to making it successful. I'll be on the main stage or at least on a side panel, I'm sure, at some point. I'm not actually sure what I'm doing. They haven't told me what I'm saying, but I think they're promoting it with me in it. So I think I'm speaking. But uh, no, it's good. I, I can pretty much speak on the fly to anything. I don't write speeches. Speeches make me nervous. So I just go up there and I say what's on my mind. I think I'm going to talk about the seed of fire, like planting the idea that anyone can retire in like five years and that real estate is the best vehicle to accelerate your journey to fire. That's why this channel talks about real estate so much is because I think where else can you borrow against a safe fixed asset at like 3%, you know, three and a half percent. You just can't. I was borrowing at 2% for a long time. 1.99, two year fixed buying real estate, you know, borrowing a million dollars at 2% and you go invest that and make 10%, you make an 8% spread on every dollar the bank gives you. They give you a million bucks, you make 40,000, $50,000 sometimes more than that, just on the money they've given you on the spread, right? So that's what it's all about in real estate. That's why I love real estate so much is you just get extraordinary returns. As a side thing, we're actually, we've signed some letters of intent to buy some businesses, which I can't share yet because I'm under confidentiality, but some really interesting businesses we're looking to buy. Some, I'm actually really interested in businesses with a lot of intellectual property. Uh, I'm interested in businesses that cash flow really well. We're gonna blow stuff up on Amazon uh, with some businesses we're looking to buy, I think. So I can't say much more than that. But if you're interested in maybe investing in those businesses, that might be something that we do soon. Uh, the first business or two I'm going to buy myself, I like to bring it, take a business and flip it. So buy a business, say $10 million in revenue, take it to $30 million in revenue. And, or maybe buy a business that's $1 million in revenue. $1 million is pretty small. $2 million in revenue, let's say, and then 10 exit to $20 million. And so we make the spread. We sell that company at a higher multiple because it's more valuable. And uh, again, higher sales as well. So that higher multiple times higher sales equals a huge sale valuation down the line. We all get a huge payout. That's the journey for me to you know, 100 million, to a billion. A billion's actually possible. If I just grow at a 
at a CAGR, compounded annual growth rate of like 13% on my current net worth, I hit billionaire. Like, well, I'm still young enough to enjoy it. That's, that's crazy. Like, for, to say that if I just continue to grow with this level of, you know, 13%, which is totally doable. I mean, I can lend to people like, yeah, like in real estate, I make like 25% returns with the bank's money, right? So that's, should be easy. Again, the more capital you get, the harder it is to deploy. Let's go down here and see these messages. Uh, someone sent an image. Crowdjoy sent an image. I'm gonna open it up. A property in Windsor. I lost my chat bar. Come back, chat bar. There it is. Okay. Look, Cal, getting all those nice action shots. Right. Just such a photographer. I love it. Uh, I gotta get his name. Petrol, what? I missed what that was relating to, Eric. I, oh, petrol, maybe he means like gas or like some sort of like oil. Did I not answer his question? No, I didn't. He's right. Do you use HELOCs when you invest? So, Brian, thank you, Jonas, for keeping me accountable. I got another comment and got distracted. So, do you use HELOCs to invest? I do not currently use a HELOC. I have used HELOCs in the past. A HELOC stands for a home equity line of credit. Brian, thank you for asking that. And Jonas, thank you for following up to keep me accountable, guys. Just like your spouse needs to keep you accountable in the next video I'm dropping on frugality and early retirement. So, HELOCs can be great for a number of reasons. One, get the Smith Maneuver benefit. So that basically a tax strategy here in Canada where when you take money from your primary residence through a HELOC, you borrow that money and you go invest that money in a rental property, the interest payments now on your primary house that you live in become tax deductible. Whereas before, if you just had a mortgage on your house you live in, the mortgage payments are not tax deductible. So that makes basically the capital in your house tax deductible. Great strategy, big fan of that. Uh, so I love HELOCs for that reason alone. I think it makes sense to pay off your mortgage, go get a HELOC or go get another mortgage on it and use that capital directly to buy property or invest in certain assets because then the interest is tax deductible. Huge boon to your overall personal net worth. So that's why I love HELOCs. I don't, I think HELOCs have low loan to value ratios, 65, 70%, so I've mostly seen. You rarely get that 80% loan to value. So if you wanna get more capital out, you're better off just getting a mortgage on the property than a HELOC. The advantage of the HELOC is you can pay it down anytime you want. You have complete flexibility. I have unsecured lines of credits that I use. At, I have sixty, seventy thousand dollars, eighty thousand, almost hundred thousand dollars in lines of unsecured lines of credits. Secured against nothing. That I can just borrow against at five, six percent. So I prefer that, um, just because I again can get more out of my initial property than I can from a HELOC. They operate in much the same way. I definitely do use those lines of credits. Have them there for a rainy day in case we don't have the cash to close on a property. It's nice to have those there. Big fan of that because again, you get the write off of taking your basically your mortgage capital and making it tax deductible. It's much better than using cash. Big fan of that. We're talking about refis, the second part of your question. I, I prefer 80% loan to value on a refi over a HELOC. I'd rather take, if I'm getting this new valuation that's much higher than it was before, I want to pull that capital out, right, and redeploy it on the next property or take it somewhere else, right? You want to have the least amount of capital invested in the property without paying private mortgage insurance that you can. So if you can go refi and pull all your money out with the burr, you don't want necessarily to go with a uh, HELOC because if you're pulling 65% of the new appraised value, you're not going to get a full burr. If you can go get a mortgage on it, you get a higher loan to value. You can take 80% of the loan to value out of the property. So you just get more money out of that rental property not doing a HELOC. So I don't like HELOCs on rental properties. I can see the value of a HELOC in that if you were someone who wanted to be risk averse and have your mortgage paid down and have access to that capital, to invest in a property whenever you needed to, I can understand why you'd want to have a portfolio with HELOCs on all your properties. Because then you can just raise a million bucks like that out of your HELOCs. It's a strategy for someone who is really risk averse. Someone who's you know, a little bit more open to risk and higher return would prefer an 80% loan to value mortgage. So really great question. Uh, I love the cash out refis without doing the HELOC. So I go do a mortgage purchase plus improvements where we set a quote for higher than the work we're gonna do and then basically get like the difference back so say we do 30,000 in rentals, submit a $60,000 purchase plus, you get the $30,000 difference in your pocket when they come back. And that doesn't require a full appraisal, it's just the action that you actually did the work that you said you are gonna do. You completed the, the quote that you submitted with an invoice. So that's a really easy way to get a partial burr. A full burr would be going back to the bank and trying to refinance the property, paying all the mortgage breakout fees and putting another mortgage on the property. 
if you put a collateral charge mortgage on the property when you first bought it, you, there's no legal fees because they registered a higher amount already. They say they register a $500,000 mortgage on the $300,000 property and you go back and get a higher appraisal for 400, you just can basically draw those funds right out because it's a collateral charged mortgage. Really great type of mortgage product. A big fan of it for the refis. But yeah, there's lots of ways to do it. Uh, in the beginning, I would just break my mortgages to get access to the capital. I'd break it, pay the fees, throw a new mortgage on top. If the appraisal doesn't come out good, you don't have to break. So there's no risk in getting an appraisal on your property and try and get the highest value you can. Just the cost of the appraisal, which is a couple hundred bucks. And the bank will often, if you get the mortgage through them, pay for that appraisal. Especially in this interest rate environment where they're very hungry for business. In this current economy right now, the banks, they tightened up originally and now they're hungry for business because no one's meeting the metrics to qualify and they need to do that business to continue to be profitable. So thank you, Jonas, for keeping me accountable. And the Floby, uh, I don't know what that is about petrol, but it sounds like maybe you need a little bit of oil in it or something to, to operate it. I don't know. I like to use an electric one, but I do put a little bit of oil in the, in the, razor, in the uh, shaver after it's done because it just cuts the hair smoother next time. The blades don't get rusty and dull. Matthew McClure says, sorry, I misspelled something. I enjoy your videos. Hey, awesome. Thanks for the comment, Matthew. I appreciate that. Okay, I'm gonna do one more comment and then I'm gonna jump down to the bottom and get someone right from the bottom. Okay, where was I here? I lost my, my uh, spot. Where was I, guys? Petrol, what? Oh, there's Matt. Okay, so Sean says, hi, Mike. Just found your YouTube channel and follow you on Instagram literally one second ago. Keep up the good content. Thanks, Sean. I uh, appreciate that. Yeah, if you guys are not following me on Instagram, go follow me on Instagram because I post stories like two to 10 stories a day. You see when I post private deals, you see when I close houses, you'll see what I'm doing on a daily basis, sharing some of the tips. Sometimes I'm just sharing like reno tips or sharing like deals on stuff that I find for materials. Maybe I'm just sharing like random stuff about my life. If you wanna follow along in the journey, jump on there and follow my stories on Instagram. I love Instagram, it's a great place to contact me. You can DM me there. Facebook's another good place, but I like Instagram a lot more than I like Facebook. I think it's the future, definitely. Now to the bottom. Is it possible, so App Factory says, is it possible to get 10K passive income in five years? Yes, 10K passive income in five years is totally possible. I did exactly that in less than five years. Totally possible, 100%. 10K passive income is a fat fire. It's hard to spend 10K, even with a family, in a month. So I think 10K a month is totally doable. If you buy real estate in like London, Ontario, you could do that in like, depending on the properties, if you bought like really expensive triplexes, like higher end triplexes with lots of bedrooms, you could do that in like five properties. So five $390,000, $400,000 properties, so two million bucks in real estate here in London, Ontario, would get you about 10,000 a month in passive income. And it could be actually passive, not if you manage it yourself. If you guys are managing your own real estate portfolios, it is not passive. People like to claim passive income. Look at my 10 properties I've got. I've been there, I've done it. If you don't have a manager in place and a manager to manage that manager, it is not passive. You're getting the calls from the tenants. It's a lot of effort and energy. That's why I started the property management company so I don't have to deal with those calls. Thankfully, we're getting a staff, a team in place to deal with those problems. And that's truly passive income. I honestly do believe in the beginning, you got the energy, you got the hustle, you can do it. But once you've got 10,000 a month in passive income, you don't want to be dealing with tenant calls. You, you really don't. Maybe when you have $500 in passive income coming in or 1,000 in passive income, that's when you, you know, you're just starting out. You can go ahead and deal with those tenant calls. But big advocate, if you want truly passive income at factory, you definitely need to focus on finding a property manager. Or if you want to get passive income from dividends or some other source or buying businesses, you need to make sure you have a good general manager in place in those private businesses you're buying. If you're buying public stocks, like public equities that pay dividends that say five, six percent a year, there are many utility companies that pay seven, eight percent uh, per year. So those companies, you could just, again, put to get 10,000 a month in passive income. Let's do some quick math here, guys. What do you need at the different levels of return? So I'm gonna use my phone here, sorry. If you wanted $10,000 a month, it's $120,000 a year. <clears throat> at the 4% safe withdrawal rate, you need $3 million in capital. Now, if you could withdraw 8% a year, which I think from a real estate portfolio in like London, Ontario, totally feasible net of management fees to withdraw 8% a year. Um, probably way high. I think you could probably withdraw 20% a year fairly safely. I'd, I'd almost bet money that all of my investors will make 20% return on their investment um, minimum, minimum per year. That means they will double their money in like four to five years. Some of my investors have doubled their money in six months with a lucky full burr. Can't guarantee that, but so yeah, it's totally 
feasible depending on the method of attack that you use. Um, at an 8% return, you need a million and a half bucks to get 10,000 a month in passive income. Myself personally, I'm on this goal of, I want a million dollars a year in passive income, which is a stretch goal. And why? Because I have this mentorship program and I've got to shine for these guys and be motivated each and every day. And I lose motivation hard when I think to myself, Mike, like you're good. You've got passive income coming in. It's hard to hustle and to stay hungry if you don't have those lofty goals. So that's why I've set these big goals for myself to keep myself accountable, keep myself productive. I like being productive, but without a lofty goal, I can't be productive. So I've set goals for myself now, short-term goals of 10 million net worth and a million passive. And I've set a long, long-term goal of becoming a billionaire. And it's actually not that hard. I just have to keep growing at current rates, which yeah, totally doable. Good question, good question. Um, Brandon's getting hungry. All right, I'm jumping back up now. I gotta go up, up to the bottom and top, bottom and top, keep people engaged, right? Trying this new form. Right now I'm studying my A-levels. Jamal says, I don't know what A-levels are. You have to quali qualify that for me. Uh, Live and Breathe Real Estate says, you have to speak straight from the dome. You could be a freestyler. Straight from the dome, what does that even mean? I'm not sure. I'm so I'm so out of the loop. I thought I was in the loop. Apparently not. I'm not. I'm not <laughs> in the loop. I'm old, guys. I'm 26 years old. I'm gonna be 27 this year. Can you believe it? At the end of this year, I'm gonna be 27. I'm getting older. Yeah. I'm not gonna be that young guy. Luckily, I still look like I'm 19. Like people, people literally when I was in Miami, they were like, "What? I get ID'd?" And people were like, "Wait, like you're 21? There's no way you're 21." So especially when I shave. Like right now, I keep the stubble look, so I don't look like I'm a, a baby. But if I shave clean. It's a real issue. I'm old, he says, in a room with a 31 year old. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're really old by that metric. Um, if you're old, I'm. Now I feel bad. Getting, I don't feel bad. I make now. no apologies. No. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Crowdjoy says, Mike, found this deal. Seems to be too good to be true. Please take a look if you want. Thanks. Crowdjoy, you were the one who sent me that link that I couldn't help but click on because I was curious if it was the, uh, the flow. What was that thing called? The flow bee? I was actually curious if it was, but it wasn't. Instead, it was a listing that you sent me to 1321 Henry Ford Center, Windsor. Now, I wish I knew a ton about Windsor. I don't. I'm not going to claim to be an expert. Uh, looks like this is a listed property. They put it on Kijiji, but it's just like an automated bot that's throwing this up on Kijiji to make you think it's like a private deal, but you can see at the bottom it's a sales uh, rep has put this up. And it says, great money-making duplex. By the way, guys, you can all go up, scroll up in the chat, and click on this too. And then that'd be a cool way to do live deal analysis. You just click on the link and see it at the same time. So go click that link and you can see it too. It's $99,880, 99880 So just under $100,000 for this property. It has some nasty stucco and wood exterior. Looking at it and I'm seeing great money making duplex investment opportunity in Ford City, consisting of two bedroom upper units Two two-bedroom units. Upper tenant pays $950 all-inclusive. Lower tenant pays $850 all-inclusive. Those are pretty good rents. Uh, features include new furnace and laundry in each unit. Property being sold in as-is condition. Hmm. Why would it be as-is? Is there a structural issue or something that they're hiding? Maybe an oil tank buried. Maybe some roof leak. As-is, just got to be careful, guys. They do that sometimes because they're hiding something. They don't want to be liable. Sometimes it's nothing at all, and they're just trying to protect their own butt by saying, hey, as is. We make no warranties or representations about the property. It is what it is. Get a home inspection. Not necessarily a red flag. I wish I had more data. This is all we have. We have lot size 30 by 100. It's a small lot, but do you care as an investor? Does it have parking? I don't know. That's the question. we got to find out. Taxes are $825 a year. So low. Um, this would cash flow. There is no doubt in my mind. I don't know how to, oh, it's a picture, so I can't even click the listing. Uh, okay, so based on what I see there, which is not much, uh, looks like Google cash flow. We got what, it was 850 and 750 in rent, so you've got like 1600 in rent or something. Maybe you can get 1800 maximum. He's getting pretty close to max Windsor rents based on like my limited understanding of Windsor. Um, it sounds like it's in, it's maybe been delayed a bit inside the maintenance. So it might be a little bit rougher inside because there's no pictures of the inside, just a picture of the outside. That leads me to believe it might be a little bit rougher inside. So first quick analysis because I don't have more data to go on. It's not a proper MLS listing. It's a little Kijiji picture you sent me. But based on what I see there, it sounds like it'd be a 1.5% rule. In Windsor, I'd like to get a 2% rule. 
just because Windsor has a high level of risk. You saw last week they had 1,600 job, 1600 jobs lost. It's a very blue collar community. It's rougher. So you need a higher cash flow from that. Same thing in Sarnia, Windsor, uh, you know, Corona, uh, all, the, all the markets, you know, small markets like that. You know, Windsor being 200,000 people or so, it's about a little less than half of London, maybe a third of London, between a third and a half of London size, but not the same resiliency from overall diversity perspective of the economy. So there's a lot of blue color there, maybe 15,000 students in Windsor. So they don't have the same, as a percentage of their population, the same amount of students that London does, which I think gives it a little less resiliency. It's also next to Detroit, which gives it, is a pro Anacon. I think you, I'm actually bullish overall on Windsor once they experience a little bit more of a decline. It's, the market's too hot right now for me, but when things cool again, get the next cool off, I'd probably be investing in Windsor. We'll be expanding into Windsor. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a, probably a good deal. I've seen better deals. I've seen properties. I saw a, a $200,000 property in Windsor that had nine bedrooms in it, and it needed not much rental, like 5,000. So you'd be all in 205,000, nine bedrooms at like 450 a bedroom call it 500 bedroom, you're like well over 2% rule. Those properties are attractive to me. Compared to London's 1% rule, you get 2% rule in Windsor, that's good. Um, you get some strong, strong cash flow. You get 40, 50% ROI just on cash flow. I don't think Windsor's gonna have the same appreciation that London will. I think it's more prone to recession. I think you have less of an appreciation play, but there is definitely a market there. I think long-term vacancy rates will be a bit higher there. We've seen guys like Matt McKeever and a few of the YouTube influencers drive Windsor, single-handedly drive Windsor up. And so that's kind of boosted Windsor and the Toronto attention has kind of shifted and the eyes sort of looked at Windsor. But yeah, I mean, it is cool, right? When guys like are actually influencing a market, that's, that's insane, that's powerful. Imagine you go buy 50 properties there and then you drop some videos and influence a whole market. That's the power I was, uh, where I'm getting towards, right? It's crazy. How many influencers are there on Canadian real estate in Canada? There's probably like 20 or 30 of us, 40 of us maybe, yeah. maybe 50 that have like YouTube channels or like decent presences. My goal should be to get in the top 10 real estate influencers, buy a bunch of properties in a city and then pump it <laughs> and then get all the attention there and then drive the market up. No, I can't do that. Okay. Not before I get a few better deals. <laughs> yeah. We need, to, we need to figure out your financing. That's the hardest part with you because yeah. we need the, the provable income. You should actually just start claiming Income. You get two years financials, and we can just get you all the financing. Matt said Matt did say that I could funnel because like they basically want me on full time, right? So you could get you get a contract that? like that and yeah. run that income through a business, and then or even just as a full time employee, and then you could get financing. Yeah, we should talk about that offline. Uh, okay, we got one question from the bottom. Uh, App Factory is twenty two and feels old. Jonas jumps in. Way is thirty five. See you good. Oh, everyone jo jokes that like Way looks way older than he is. Uh, he's not he's not 35 no but like everyone thinks he looks they think he looks old so people think he looks 35 sometimes mm. so people have said that before it's like a joke running right now so i don't think he looks old. it's just that like for an asian dude he has a full beard like from here all the way down he's full chinese like there's no reason like most chinese guys do not have thick facial hair yeah he's got a thick like i'm not gonna go into like his what he is but he's a hairy asian dude and that makes him look older than he is um, so <laughs> jokes aside, he hasn't looked that old, but like we joke with him. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna grab you a know he's going to get that now. He's never going to, he hasn't watched my, my stuff anyway. He, I don't even think he subscribed. No, no, he's going to get that for me now. Oh yeah. Every time I see him, I'm going to be like, how's it going Harry Asian? <laughs> I mean, look at his face. He is Harry, right? That's is he a Harry Asian? <laughs> That's what he's he could just wax. <laughs> uh, I wish I was hairier. I'm so hairless. Like. I have like six chest hairs and like a little bit of belly hair. That's it. I wish I had like a full like manly beard. Like, could you imagine if I had a beard like that? Wouldn't that be so cool? Right now I can just grow like a little chin hair yeah. thing. It's starting to connect right here though. That's something. That's yeah. for, the, for the first time. I've always had like a gap like here-ish. Yeah. Where it like doesn't really grow on very well. I'm hoping by 30 but... everything changes. Yeah. Fingers crossed, guys. Pray for my beard. Yeah, Pray for the rose heart beard. Be able to do it. I think I'm just a late... I, didn't, I wasn't a late bloomer at puberty, but just like a, I got armpit hair and leg hair super soon, but I just never got a beard. It just took forever. It's European genetics. It's a real bummer. But fingers crossed, guys. I already can rock a goatee. The question is, can I get the connection? It's coming. By 30, I'll have a full beard, I believe. Okay. Definitely looking forward to connecting soon. Do, do, do. 
Okay. Mm, scrolling down, scrolling down. I hate them and started my own business. Should I drop out and pursue my business? I'm confused. Okay. I'm studying my A levels. I hate them and have started my own business. So Jamal, Raja, I'm curious what you specifically are referencing. So should you start your own business? Um, might be a great idea. I don't think you should throw away the day job right away. I think you should work the nine to five, get home, spend an hour or two relaxing, whatever with family, and then hustle from like seven to 11. This is like some Gary Vee stuff right here. I, I'm listening to myself and I'm like, this is exactly what Gary Vee would probably say. But it's the truth, it's the best advice. Honestly, it's what worked for me. And hustling hard does work. If you work harder than everyone else, you will succeed. He'd throw a few in more curse words. In he, would. he would, he would. Yeah. That's about it. Truth. <laughs> Are index funds useful for early retirement? I think so. I think index funds are great. They're super simple. They're easy. You buy ETF or index funds. I like exchange traded funds because they're low cost, really well diversified portfolios. They have the Vanguard has the all-in-one ETF now. You get a couple of like, I think you could do a little bit better than the all-in-one, but even the all-in-one alone is like you buy it, set it and forget it, and just collect like a safe 6% return. That's great for retirement, I actually think, honestly. Um, so I'm a big fan of that. Am I still connected here? Yeah, I am, okay. <clears throat> okay. Now to the bottom answer question. Mike, how hard is it to install a steel beam in a basement? What is the best way to get multiple estimates? Angie's list, question mark, TY. So William, um, yeah, places like Craigslist, Angie's list, uh, Kijiji are places to get guys. I think that it is difficult because the, the metal I-beams that you put in, they're like shaped like an eye. That's why they call them I-beams. Um, they'll save you space. You can do it in wood as well, but the problem with wood is you need to do like two by 10 to get the same efficacy or strength as like a five inch steel beam. So obviously get your drawings done by your engineer and make sure the load can carry. But the metal, I like, I like steel. Uh, it does way better. You get better headroom. You get better... Um, like when you drywall it and you finish it, you can literally glue the drywall right to the metal beam to get maximum headroom to pass the 6.5 building codes and stuff. Uh, makes the places feel more open when you have less. The I-beam also can carry a weight load across a larger distance. So where you maybe needed columns before, you could take those out in a load-bearing wall and put a metal I-beam and support it on, on two sides. And that can often pass depending on the thickness and the strength of the steel. Steel will bend just like wood and uh, carry the load across. It's very heavy. To put a, uh, like a steel I-beam in, you need like a dozen guys. So one contractor on Angie's list is not going to be able to put in a metal I-beam for you. You're going to need like a bunch of guys to carry it in, lift it in. Something you need a building permit for as well. So make sure you're getting your proper inspections. Probably need engineer drawings. It is unfortunately one of those things that is a bit more complex to do. That said, not near as complicated or as expensive as people think that it is. Hope that helps your question. Uh, Erica retracted her message. I'm going back up to grab someone from up top here. Uh, da, 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 da. Where were we? What are, so Matthew McClure asks, what are your best tips for house hacking a quadplex? So the only downside to house hacking a quadplex is there have been arguments that you can't get the, the primary residence capital gains exemption. So if your fourplex doubles in value and you live there, you'll need to claim a quarter of the property's value as primary exemption because you didn't occupy the rest of the spaces. And so you didn't occupy the majority of the house. So the majority of the house is used as a rental property. So you'll pay capital gains when you sell the house. I'd much rather buy a house that's got seven bedrooms in it as a single family house and get the capital gains exemption. So you sell it down the road tax-free. It's one of the most powerful vehicles in Canada. <coughs> it's the argument I can see for people buying a $700,000 house and selling it for a million bucks in five years or 10 years. Those arguments people have made to me, like, hey, I didn't cash flow, but I sold my house for a $300,000 tax-free gain. It was better than if I even house hacked it. I can understand those. That's actually a form of house hacking, believe it or not, and a strategy that I used when I built a house in 2015. And I lived there for two years. And we sold it for like a $60,000, $70,000 $70, tax-free gain, tax gain, so free money. Um, and I also happened to have my brother live with me to cover costs, and some other stuff happened along the way, which made it even better of a house hack. But there, are, there is a house hack strategy or you don't have any tenants. You just use the tax advantages to hack it. So you build a house with the intention to sell it and then live in it till the minimum time you need to establish it as your primary residence, which is like 13 months. I went a little bit safer, went two years just because my mortgage was a two year period and then sell and move on. 
But back to your question, um, how do you hack it? Or what are the best tips? Buy it, make it nice, so you can get quality tenants that have to you have to live beside them, your neighbors, right, in your fourplex. So I would say take the smallest unit for yourself and rent out the other three biggest units, make them really nice, and get top dollar. I like luxury rentals where I live because then you get the best quality tenants where you live. You don't want guys with cockroaches or bed bugs living in your house. And if you're in the C rental area or the D rental area, you're gonna get bed bugs and cockroaches and they're gonna move between units. So if I'm doing a fourplex, I'm making sure it's a luxury fourplex, 100%, make it nice. That's my advice for you. Hopefully get great cash flow. That's amazing because you're living in like three of the units are going to guarantee cover your mortgage. You're probably making money to live there. So your living costs are negative every month probably. I bet you the money, there's enough money left over to cover your food and your transportation. Maybe even your entertainment if you're lucky. Depending on where the triplex, the fourplex is and how expensive it was, what market, etc. But yeah, great, great question. Live and breathe real estate says, are you still investing in stocks? Yes. Admittedly, I haven't had the best success this year. Um, if you look at the stock SNS, Select Sands, bought it on a friend's recommendation, unfortunately. Um, I still do believe in the company, but I took a huge ride and lost twenty something thousand dollars on a stock that it shouldn't even be trading at the price it's trading at. I think there's upside potential. The good news is I didn't buy it on my TFSA, I bought it on my open account. So I sold that on December 31st and I got some tax loss harvesting. So half those gains get to be a tax write off. That's a win. Sorry, all those gains get to be a tax write-off, but half of them, because uh, my tax rate's like 50%. Erica retracted her message. Two messages retracted. Uh, I think that's what makes you so different. You invest in any opportunity that provides you with the returns you require. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily, I'm agnostic. I'm like a capitalist in the sense that like, the thing I love about capitalism is that it doesn't, it's not racist, it's not judgmental, it's not emotional, it doesn't, if you're a true capitalist, you don't look at like some Chinese inter guy who comes over here who's like a fob fresh off the boat and say, hey, I'm not gonna give him a job. You say, does he provide me value? Can we provide each other value? Race or like anything aside, a true capitalist will find the opportunity and they will make the money on that opportunity. So I'll buy any business. There's no business that I will not touch if it generates strong cash flow. Now, if it's cryptocurrency or something like that, that generates no cash flow, I don't want anything to do with it. If it's a tech company that has no profit, no cash flow, I probably don't want anything to do with it. I like to buy businesses that have cash flow today, that I can monetize today, and have upside for the future. But I invest for cash flow first. You want the lowest risk investment is one you have stable, safe cash flow, and you're buying based on a discount of cash flow, not of growth. Who knows what's gonna happen in the future? I'm not a speculative type of person. I like to invest in what is safe, what is now, what I can do in today's market right now. So yeah, it's the kind of investor I am and it's done very well for me and it's gonna to continue, I think, to do very well because I'm very prudent. I do a lot of analysis and research. I don't just jump into something, right? I make sure that all of the numbers make sense. When I buy a property, I have so many layers of exit strategy that I'm safe. And that's, I think, a strategy you should go into if you're looking to buy businesses or whatever it is you're trying to do with your life. Have multiple exit strategies. Selling it to someone else for more is not an is alone is not a good strategy. That's like the cryptocurrency strategy. Uh, Jamal says, but I hate it, man. Understand, like I literally hated my job. Every day I would come home just drained. I worked as an analyst, a senior analyst, and a manager for three years. And I had money jobs before that, at like places like KPMG, <clears throat> at banks, at the federal government. I had a bunch of different multitude of jobs. I was a teller at a credit union. Not a single job I'd ever worked. I worked two years at Tim Hortons in the service industry. And it's probably my favorite job. Of all the jobs I've ever held, it was my favorite because the crew was great. We were all young guys working together, guys and girls. There's like three girls and like four guys in the team. And we, were, we had a good, good thing going. It was fun working there. But even that was felt like when I was done in work, I was tired. I wasn't working for my own goals. I wasn't aligned to my own vision. It wasn't doing something that I felt meaning and drove purpose from. It was like in a sector I didn't enjoy, but it paid well. And maybe you're doing the same thing, maybe, just maybe, you could work on your side hustle in the evening and then pivot jobs into a job you enjoy more that pays maybe a little bit less or the same. And at least you're doing something you enjoy for the five years you need to grind. Because unfortunately, I know the answer you want is like, just quit your job and enjoy your life. I could tell you that it's not the best financial choice probably for you. You should probably continue to grind. Um, it makes more sense to continue to grind. You could take a year off and 
I mean, you're young enough, right? That like you take a year off probably, I don't know how young you are, but I assume you're young. If you're young, you can take a year off and enjoy maybe entrepreneurship, go and start a business or two. And the worst case that happens is like you're 23 and you've wasted a year, you're 22 and you wasted a year. That's not a big deal. You can always go back and, and work again. Just be prepared that taking that year to chase entrepreneurship when it may fail because 95% of entrepreneurial ventures fail. Keep in mind that most businesses you're going to start are going to fail, especially if you don't have a good track record. If you don't have a good track record, the chance of failing is way higher. If you've actually been, like Warren Buffett goes into a business or like myself having experience in different businesses and a business background, when I go into a business, my probability of success is much higher because my network is strong and I have good business fundamentals. I can turn around a business. But someone who has no experience, they have a huge, it's a huge risk. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to pivot and how to ensure their business survives when they go over that next road bump. So that's something to keep in mind and factor in. I'm trying to play the two hats here. On one side, you got like the, the Gary V type who are going to say like, just chase your dream and do, do you. At the same time, like I'm of the type that you should continue to grind. You haven't earned it. If you haven't made the fire, you haven't built the fire portfolio, you haven't earned the right to enjoy your life. That, that's it. I mean, it's the harsh reality. You can have many enjoyments. Like you could be working towards fire and take enjoyment every weekend. And you know, every evening you could watch an episode of Game of Thrones or something. You have some many enjoyments, but you haven't earned the right to do F all, to do nothing. You, you just haven't earned it. Unfortunately, the millennial generation today wants it now. They want it right away. And there is no, for like 99.99% .99 of the population, there is no silver bullet, no guarantee. Unfortunately, Jamal, I wish I had a better answer for you. But sometimes you have to grind and sometimes it hurts. You gotta push yourself. But when you break through, you break through that like fog, it's sunny and it's beautiful and it's worth it. That's all I have to say about that. Uh, Mike, can you share the spreadsheet you use to check if a property is worth the investment? Jamal, actually on my website, 25andfree.com, I pay for that website to stay up even though I don't post on it very often, actually at all. I don't write any blog posts on it anymore. Not to say that I won't in the future, I may. Jump on the, the go join the subscriber list there because I sometimes will send out videos or links through articles through there. But there's an article in there you can go and I actually have the spreadsheet available for download. You can also go on my YouTube channel and scroll back a bunch of videos. And there's actually a video, I can't remember what it's called. Kyle can maybe look it up. It's like um, real estate analysis tool or something. It has it in the thumbnail. You click on that, you go in the description. There's a link to there for a free download of that template. It's an old one, it's like a year too old, but it's still good, it's a good place to start. I don't know if I know which video. One of those two videos, I think I linked it in both. I don't know if I did, but there's de in one of those videos for sure, there's a link to it. Go to my website, 25andfree.com. 25 and free is like 25 times your annual living expenses and you're free. It also so happened that I was 25 when I created it and I was free. So that's the, the double meaning there on that website. I was also afraid to publish my name online and then I made a pivot and decided I was gonna put my name out there. And if it helped people to resonate with an actual person, then it was worth it. And to build a brand was kind of cool. I, I do like that. That's definitely it. So you can share that in the comments here and uh, take a look at that. Uh, Antonio, good to see you on as well. Hey, I don't see Austin on here. How am I gonna mix you guys up if I don't see you both commenting on here? What is this? Mike, can you share the Excel spreadsheet used to check if a property is worth the investment? So I did that. Um, Living Breathe Real Estate says, will you have cash available so that when the next recession hits, you can buy quality stocks for 50 cents on the dollar? Yes. The inverted yield curve appears to indicate a recession is on the way. Uh, yes. So in the past, uh, inverted yield curves were a signal that if you look in like 2007, there was an inverted yield curve. The inverted yield curve, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna botch this explaining, but basically is such that long-term returns are worse than short-term returns. So investors are flocking to short-term products and there's no incentive. So normally you have an incentive to invest in a long-term bond, right? To buy like a treasury bond or a government bond long-term because you get a higher return for locking in your money for a longer period of time called a 20 year fixed bond. What's happening right now is there's no incentive to lock in your money for a long time. The returns are actually better in the short term, only slightly. But what you should see is normally like a curve that looks like this and it just doesn't look like that right now. It's kind of like in inverted. Um, but what that means is that one of the, the takeaways is when there's an inverted yield curve, it's a signal that investors are betting that interest rates should fall, not rise. So for a long time, we thought interest rates were going to continue to rise. We saw like four or five, maybe even six Bank of Canada rate hikes on the prime interest rate lending. 
right? The, the rate that they use for lending. You saw the Bank of Canada rates increase. And uh, basically it's just a signal that the bank, what that ends up meaning is that the banks take their money, they don't invest it long term, they want to invest it short term. They tighten up their mortgage lending, right? So we should see a tightening. That'll create a little bit of a recession. I wish I had been more concise about this in my video that we just did like before this live show, where like there's a, a bit of a, a hold back of capital from the big banks in Canada. The Canadian GDP is strongest tied to what industry? What do you think that drives the Canadian economy? Real estate. It is the number one indicator for natural resources are also up there, but the Canadian real estate market is strongly correlated to Canadian market in general. So if there's a contraction by the banks of credit, they pull back some credit a little bit, that should basically hurt the housing market a little bit because people can't borrow as much from the banks. Banks are pulling back. People can't get as much capital. They can't pay as much for houses. They can't buy as many properties. Should create a little bit of a, a dip or at least a, a flattening in the housing prices. Typically, when the inverted yield curve is happening, we know that, be, that interest rates should fall. Why do interest rates fall in a recession? Because the government wants to stimulate the economy. If the government lowers Bank of Canada rates, investors go hungry for money and capital to invest in their businesses and create jobs and stimulate the economy. That's why I think, my hypothesis, is why the Bank of Canada increased interest rates. The economy's been strong. We've had a 10-year bull market. So they increased interest rates, which should hurt the economy a little bit, which it has. And now they have the power to actually drop interest rates again if they had not raised interest rates at all and we went into another recession, they'd have nothing, they couldn't drop interest rates any lower. When the overnight lending rate was zero, right? Like there's just no more they could drop it. So they need to raise it up so they can drop the interest rates back down to stimulate the economy during the next cycle. Of course I keep cash ready. I am so hungry for opportunities like this. Um, so bring them on. Bring them on. Uh, Mike, what are your requirements for someone to do a deal with you or even working with you or under you? Uh, DW, good question. I have a mentee mentorship program. Go on Instagram and look under my saved stories under mentorship and you can see what that's all about. There's like 14 different areas. You get to experience everything from construction to deal analysis to private deals, all the pieces of running successful business. It's like the entrepreneur's real estate MBA, entrepreneur's MBA. I think it's more valuable than a typical MBA. Uh, my daughter's dancing out front of the room. That's so cute. Um, <laughs> I got to wrap this up pretty soon, guys. It's getting pretty late. But uh, yeah, so the, what are the requirements? As an investor, I want you to buy five properties with us. So I want you to buy five properties. If you can't buy five properties, that means if you have the cash to buy one property, let's say you have two or 300,000 in capital, you'd be a good candidate to invest with us. Because you could buy one property and then we can refinance it and buy another one, refinance it and buy another one. We get you, if you have the cash to buy one, you can buy one property in cash, we can get you five. And I can double your money in a three to five year period, like with almost certainty. I'm not gonna guarantee anything, Past results for investors do not necessarily predict future, but I don't see us performing from a cash flow perspective any worse unless the market heats up another 20 or 30% in London, which is possible, in which case the cash flow will be disappearing, but all the people who invested now will have huge appreciation on their property. So either way, my investors kind of win. What ends up happening is my investors all win and then we're out of a business because there's just no cash flow in London anymore. They have to move to a different market. But for now, we've got cash flow in London and uh, we can enjoy it. Hopefully no one else finds out before I buy all the properties here because then I can ride the wave up. DW, good question. The mentorship program uh, comes down to offer basically a free scholarship. So it's a free program to learn with me for a year or two. But you got to commit to full time with us for a couple of years. The end result is better than an MBA where you might have to recruit for a job. You'll probably have one given to you uh, by me running one of my companies or involved in our business in some capacity through property management. Maybe you want to do renovations. Maybe you want to do private deal acquisition. All of that. There's going to be a ton of opportunities to partner with me. So that's how the mentorship program works. We've had six mentees, I guess, in total, if you count Kyle, and I, I'll count Kyle. So yeah, we, it's, I would count you. Yeah, Way was the, was the OG, I guess. He was the first in 2016, and then he, after graduating from the mentee program, he had 13 properties, and I taught him everything. He knew nothing, he didn't even understand what drywall was. He's like, what is this drywall? What is like lumber? What is flooring? Just didn't understand, right? I had to educate him all that in 2016, 2017, and now he knows a lot of what I know. At least I have the practical side. Of you do. You do the practical side of things. Every mentee comes with different skill set. We try to utilize those skills. So it's a, it's a cool program. If we get any more demand, um, my house is full. So if we get any demand, I need to rent a house around here. So I'm going to keep an eye out for that to expand the program. It's an, it's an option. I've thought about it. 
See, we gotta get Tyson a house. Because if we get Tyson a house... It needs to be like right close so I can have the meetings like walking distance. So I'm trying to find something on the street if I can. That's what That'd I'm be saying. the idea. Like, if, if we could get... If I, if I could get Tyson you don't want to own in this street house, though. Then I would have a, a room in my place that I would need to then rent out. And then we could have a men to live in my house with me. Could do that. Yeah, they just have to drive over. And they're, pre and they're pretty close. Yeah, that's true. You live pretty close. My old house is pretty close. I would ideally prefer like one right next door. If they, if they, it is, it is. But if it was like a 10 second walk, that'd be a little bit easier. It'd be better. Obviously like not perfect. It's hard to control whether I can buy houses on this sure. little crescent here, but possible. Uh, You'd be able to manage a mentee from my place, I think, pretty easily. I could. It'd just be e synergetically easier to say like, come over and they walk over like 10 seconds if they don't have a vehicle or something, right? Sure, sure. But yeah, no, theoretically we could do that, something like that. I was thinking about renting a house too, like a rent arbitrage. We rent out like a five bedroom house for like 1700 bucks. Cause rent, rent to price ratios in this area are like terrible. Really? It doesn't make sense to own. I'm not gonna buy the next Mentee house. I'm gonna rent it probably. Mm -hmm. And get some of that rent arbitrage. Like, like, like what Matt's doing with the, the mansions. Mansion, yeah. Exactly. Although I think they bought the second one. Did they buy the second one? No, I think they're renting it. I don't know though. I, I can't, can't comment either way. Awesome, answer my question. That was the strategy of going to focus on building equity and using it for HELOCs. Scott retracted his message. Scott, not sure what you said. Scott. Eric says, it is electric. Somebody here used it, says, uses petrol. I was just questioning. Okay. Uh, factory says, is it possible to get 10K? We answered that question already. We answered that question already. Uh, factory says, I want that much because I want a lot of kids. I want the Genghis Khan status. Wow. I think he has like 18,000 descendants or some like crazy number. Uh, I, that's, yeah. Or he had like that many kids or something because every village he pillaged, he would like rape a bunch of women there and impregnate them all. Yeah, that's crazy. That's so he like, just, crazy. that is insane. Yeah. You'd have to. You definitely need more passive income than 10,000 to get Genghis Khan level, but respect if you can. Basically the only man in the modern world I think that could even come close to that is Danny Bilzerian. Yeah. Just because he has a harem of women around him all the time. True. But like that's it. Or like some of the Saudi Arabian countries. Those guys have like 50 wives. True. true. They could also get close. True. Uh, Live and Breathe Real Estate says, best stories, Mike, watch them every day. Tips all day from you. I agree with Instagram. Right on. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. How is the rental going and how soon do you think you can refinance on Limberlost? May 1, when new tenants come in, I've been given an even lower rate than last week. 3.19 compared to 3.82 I have now. Wow, that's great. Uh, he's getting hungry, Mike. Okay, so now I got the getting hungry piece. I just saw that pop up at the bottom of the screen. But now I understand the context. So on L the Limberlost deal... With the rent, we built the wall, we put the window in there. Um, the floor's a little rough, so I'm gonna do the floors there. We had a contractor who started on that project, take another job somewhere else. And so we're in the midst of replacing him. That's cost us like a week to the timeline. We, we are hoping to go from A1. That is still the target. But I think I might change the scope of work to do all the floors. I was walking through it, and the first time I walked through it, the floors looked all right. And I'm walking through it, and I'm like, you know what? These floors are not, like to get a good refi, we should probably get these put in new floors in, uh, in the basement, in the main entryway there. But yeah, it's totally, totally feasible that we get a refi for, for May 1. We would just have to, if you ever get the pre-approval, then you're good to go. Um, and then we would need to get an appraiser in there. It takes a week at the appraiser will report back. The comps in the neighborhood should support in the, yeah, they, they, in that area should support in the like 230 range if we get a good appraisal. Um, which would let you get almost a full burr. And at a lower interest rate, that's a huge win. It might even be worth the breakout fees. Banks are getting very competitive now. They're losing business and they're, because they're, it's harder for people to qualify, so they can't get as much mortgage business. So they're dropping their rates. And uh, it's interesting, to say the least. Steve says, I turned my family's single home into a duplex, bi generational home, renovated the home house, whole house, and I plan to live and rent out the larger portion. Now I'm 63K in debt. Um, okay, so Steve, are you now renting it out? Are you getting cash flow now to cover that 63K in debt? Could you go back to the bank? Oh, 63K in debt is not a lot. Um, you owned the house outright before. I would argue you should go back, refinance the whole thing, pull all the money out, get more debt, and then go buy more rental properties with that capital. That'd be a good use of your capital. For 63 grand, imagine if you're getting an extra $1,200 a month in rent. The payback on that is, is great. Right, if you're getting like even twelve thousand dollars profit a year, it means you're gonna get your payback in like five years. So that's a twenty percent minimum, twenty percent return on your investment. That was a good use of your money, in my opinion. 
it probably also increased your property by more than 60,000. So you're not only gonna get your money back in five years, but you doubled your money through the reno and recouped all your money. So you probably actually added, not only did you get your money back, but you probably even added more value to the property through the renovation and you're getting cash flow. So your ROI should be triple digit by the time you're done. Scott says, great content, appreciate the insight. My question is, what does a duplex look like that meets the 1% rule? Also, do you see there being opportunity in London over the next two to three years? Yes, I'm bullish on London over the next two to three years. I hope it doesn't go as strongly as I think it's going to. I hope that it cools down. Unfortunately, I do think it is, it is uh, not going to cool down over the next couple of years in London. I think it's gonna be really strong from an appreciation standpoint. I wish it wouldn't be. It would be better if it wasn't. I get more, more deals, get a bigger business. And if it was flat, my investors are all happy because we're still getting good cash flow. So yeah, 1% uh, rule property looks like this. So if the duplex is $300,000 purchase price, you need 3,000 a month in rent. If it's a 200,000 purchase price, at least 2,000 a month in rent. That's 1% rule. So 1% of the property back in rent every month. So in 100 months, you get the full purchase price of the property back. Places like Vancouver, you get such rates where it takes like 400 months. It's crazy, they never get their money back through cash flow, they're negative cash flow. You don't have that in London, and I think if you're gonna buy real estate, you should have that. In Windsor, I look for like one and a half to 2% rule. In London, 1% rule. Uh, Steven says, what's a good way to get out while still investing? To get out while still investing. I've lost the context there. Um, to get the capital out, so like go and get a refinance and pull the capital out. You could sell the property to get your money out. Um, it depends, if you're living there all this time, it's probably capital gains free. So that's a huge benefit. You have to clarify a bit more what you mean there. I think I might have already answered it in the previous question. So David uh, Moradai says, hey Mike, if you wanna invest in a city you don't live in and are not very familiar with, what are some metrics you would like to look at to figure out whether it's a viable place to invest in? Uh, there's some metrics I would look at. Uh, vacancy rate in the market is good. Uh, look at the trends on, from a pricing standpoint. How is the price affected over the last little while? Uh, economic indicators. What is the current unemployment rate in that city? Uh, what is the diversity of the job market? So is it like Sudbury where it's just like mining and forestry where if there's a new legislation out that squashes that, the city's dead? Or is it more resilient like Toronto or Vancouver where you've got many different, London is I think honestly a pretty resilient place because it's got a lot of student markets. If you don't have a huge student population and I think financial, tech, um, we have like military, we have like distribution, we've got tons of manufacturing and food production plants, all this kind of stuff. Tons of different resiliencies. I think education is a big one. If you're in an education town, you're pretty safe. I don't think education is going anywhere. And in fact, in recessions, student type properties tend to do even better. Uh, in fact, people go back to school. So enrollments tend to increase in times of recession. They get laid off and their employer pays them to go back to school. So a market like London does really well in a recession. So resiliency is really important. I think that's kind of the main things I would look for. There's probably a few other things. Well, straight from the dome means straight from your mind. <laughs> straight from the mind. Just laying it out as I see it. I get it. It's a dome. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Jonas, first property timeline goal. Yeah, share your, your first property timeline goal, Jonas. I think we're getting close. Next few months, we just got to have that offline conversation about your, your parents from the financing perspective. App Factory says, I remember when I was 16, no worries. All I did was play video games and beat off to hente. Okay. Now I'm 22 filled with stress, life. <laughs> I mean, my life's as good now as it was then, for the most part. So I guess once you reach financial independence, it's as good then as it was, it's as good now as it was then. But yeah, there is a, a definite, I had a seven year grind where it was hard. Life's hard. You could also do it moderately. There's lots of versions of fire. There are versions of fire where you just like work four days a week and you take three days off. Some people can't handle a seven day work week. It's just not in their genetic, they just can't do it. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It just takes you longer to get fired and you enjoy your life a little more to get there. Jake says, hey Mike, how is the mentee program going? It's going very well. Thank you for asking, Jake. We have actually a fourth mentee coming in, so I'm really excited for that. I'm 21 and don't feel old. If you're 22 and feel old, that's pathetic. Sorry, I don't know how your life is, though, obviously. Uh, Take a joke. Yeah. You know why I feel old? Because I have a daughter that wakes me up every morning like, like that. Um, I feel old because I'm grinding all the time. But to be honest with you, uh, I am young. Yeah, I work a lot of hours. It's, it, it's actually, it's 
said it's it's like it's you and like Peter. There's like there's like five percent of the population that works I think at this level. Like I know a lot of like at Infotech where I used to work, there's a lot of people who worked long hours. In iBanking, I know a lot of guys who work long hours. There are like several segments that work like this. I would say five to ten percent of the population. The other ninety percent don't work this hard. And that's fine. Like I do wonder that it's less than five to ten percent. I do wonder that it's well, maybe. closer to one. Could be. It's a, it's high industrial a lot of people in Toronto though, like in the Toronto market, people work they leave for work at six in the morning and they get back at seven PM. That's a normal job. Because the commute, because the commute, commute, right? Yeah, but that's, that's like that's like a few million Canadians right there. Yeah. So. I, I wouldn't count that technically, but. Fair enough. If they, if they could choose to not have the commute, <coughs> they would bet that most of them would choose to not have the commute. Oh yeah. Right. I agree. No yes, one. I don't think people are choosing people. this option, but I guess I am choosing this option. Whereas, so. Oh yeah, most people who work that hard just naturally they choose. Oh my god. Hard naturally. naturally. There's so many questions here. <laughs> okay, guys, let's do rapid fire. I'm going to come down here to the laptop and we're just going to do it fast. Is it hard to have the energy you're constantly shooting it in a tissue? What? Oh, God, is that the Vente reference? Why did I just read that out loud? Erica retracted her message. Jesus Christ. <laughs> D's information says, trust me, you don't want to have to shave every day. Enjoy being hairless. Uh, I, I kind of, yeah, I can go like four or five, six days. It's kind of nice. If I go too long, then I get like a gross goatee. I still do shave twice a week, but yeah. You look thick, though. I don't grow fat. I don't grow facial hair very fast, and I don't have a ton. You guys can see for yourselves. Hello. I don't think it zoomed in. I think it was still blurry. It's probably blurry and it's dark. Hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> How hard is it to install a steel beam? We answered that question. Um, can I just pretend to live in a property? Yes, you could theoretically do that. Hello. How do I have to work? before I can borrow from the bank? Uh, Zev, good question. So typically six months employment history. So if you can get an employment history of six months from a company, you're good to go. Assuming the company like is somewhat trustworthy in, in an actual company, like if it's just like, yeah, if they're a, just a fake shell company you set up, you need two years financials. Like if you have ownership in that company in some way, but if it's legitimately an independent employer, then yeah, you could use that, which like Kyle should probably do that too. Get a, we should talk about that offline. You could get like a user, get a salary, so then you could just be golden. Um, True. I've been trying to buy a property from this for sale by owner since October 2018. I normally give the owner one month to sign each contract. She has let every contract expire. I am offering full price. Would you move on or just keep writing offers? So I don't let people think on offers at all. I go in and it's like, you're gonna sign this in the next 24 hours, revocable or 48 hours. You don't let people shop your offers. Close it right then and there. If they don't want to sell, move on. If they haven't signed back your offer in like months and months and months, they're probably not going to sell. When they're ready to sell, have them call you and build that relationship and it's there. But uh, yeah, I, I've never done, I've never had negotiations go like that. There's been back and forth where we signed back and forth till we came to a price over a few months. Not in this hot market, but it has happened. Uh, thank you, Matt, for your, your comment. How would you find a good bird property as your first investment property when your network isn't as developed as you would like? Uh, very difficult. You got to look on the MLS hard. You got to look at 100 properties and one of them will qualify. And then also go network and develop your, your network with wholesalers and things like that. Great advice there. Um, I wish I had known that sort of thing earlier and networked harder early on. I would have got better deals. The biggest thing is you're not going to get a full burr. Like most people don't get full burrs. Their first deal it just doesn't happen. So don't expect it. Buy your first property, get a partial burr, and then save up for your next property. At least you're in the game, better than sitting on cash. At least your money's making money. Hi, Michael. Good to see you on. Steve uh, Garrett says, maybe you already do, but I may I ask you to give a day or two notice before you do these so I can tune in when the live stream starts. Thank you either way. I've learned a lot from your channel. Steve Garrett, I go live for the Wise Wall Show every single Wednesday at around 7 p.m. Sometimes at 7.15 p.m.-ish, but 7 p.m. every single Wednesday the Wise Wall Show every week without a fail. So if you want to tune in, that's when it is. You guys will, uh, I don't know how to give a notice other than that. Maybe people don't Put see the banner. Man. Put it in your calendar, 7 p.m. every Wednesday. Calendar, send notification. Uh, okay. How much should you put aside for property repairs? Half a percent to 1% or a quarter percent to 1% of the property's value. So if it's a $300,000 property, put like, Two to three thousand dollars away, roughly, depending on how old the property is. The older it is, the less repaired it is. The more renovation you're gonna have to do, the more maintenance you're gonna have to do. If it's like a brand new build, you don't have to budget much at all. It's about eight grand right now, though, to set aside. Is that enough for 
Way, way more than you probably need, given the current condition. Also, my ver emergency button, so. Uh, Tiger says, st oh, there, ever jumped in. More like 7.15 to 7.20. Tiger says, true. I need to get better. We need to start doing it right at 7. My bad. We're going to start filming, like, earlier. And we're going to do it earlier. And I'm going to be back on at 7 o'clock. Does the impact valuation matter at all? Could it be useful to look at the ratio between the impact value and the listed price? Um, no, impact value doesn't really matter. Some people use that as an indicator, and it's not a good indicator of value at all. They don't appraise the property to determine impact value. It's often very dated, not keeping up with the current market at all. So I wouldn't buy properties based on impact value at all. In the olden days, like five years ago, I remember realtors used to use that metric, say they would try to get like within 5% of the impact value. It's a stupid hack that doesn't work, especially in this market. Um, impact varies widely. Some areas shoot up in value and the impact stays relatively flat for a long time. It takes a long time for the government to raise their appraised assessed value on the properties. They raise it up at like inflation. Or if they see you get a building permit to do renovation, they will often increase your property taxes through the impact. Um, so impact values the property and then they multiply that impact valuation by your property tax mill rate, which is the rate of tax times the value of the property per dollar. Uh, so it'd be a good idea. So Kyle's, I showed Kyle's comment there to the link. I just hit show on it so you can see it now. Uh, so it'd be a good idea to sell your house to get the capital gains benefit. If you can find something similar, redeploy the capital instead of holding and selling later without that benefit. Very right. Um, the 31 people watching, Brennan says, hit that like button. Thank you, everyone. Hit that like button. Much appreciated. Take your rocks. says sometime in the next four months, hopefully, we will see. That's right. 100%. I'm moving to London October 2020. Ooh, Awesome. You have to come out to London on fire and we'll have to do a meetup. Brandon says, it's hard to keep cash on the side because of FOMO, if the dip doesn't come for a few years, you miss out on those gains. Very true. So I would say buy smart, buy cash flowing properties, refinance the capital all out, and then you have your cash back ready for the next deployment. So theoretically the next recession. The thing of the, even if there was a 20% drop, if you wait three years for that, you could have made 25% of your money over those three years and almost doubled your money just in those three years before the drop. So it's almost always better to buy and hold, what is, the, what is the saying? Time in the market is better than timing the market. Uh, Olinda says, how much money did you spend on purchasing your first house? So I bought my first house for 208,000. I put a $40,000 down payment on that property, which took everything we had, all of our summer job income I had saved up and all my income that I had saved up. And yeah, used it all. And I had scholarship money that I used for that and then took loan out to survive the school year. But it allowed me to live for free in my second year summer onwards throughout my remaining two years of school. Uh, do you sell homes by apocalypse listings to avoid real estate agent commissions? Crowdjoy, uh, yes and no. There's no one size fits all. I like pocket listings. They can often be a good deal. Sometimes they're not a good deal. It just depends. Same with wholesale deals. There are a ton of bad wholesale deals, especially right now. I'm seeing a lot of wholesalers in this hot market selling properties at 98 cents on the dollar. And I'm like, wait, this is an MLS deal. You're just a glorified real estate agent that isn't bound by RICO, so not looking out for my best interest and taking a higher payout than a real estate agent does. So they're taking sometimes 10% of the purchase price in a fee, which real estate agents charge like three to four, maybe 5% of the total transaction. And they're out there looking for your best interest, putting conditions in. And these wholesalers are often putting no conditions in, making you take huge risk on massively delayed gratification or delayed maintenance type properties that need a lot of work. Yona says, we have to buy that. You know what out. Yeah, Jonathan says, do you protect your stocks with stock options? No, I don't. 815 bath time reminder, thanks, Mike, get better. <laughs> thanks, guys. Appreciate that, William. Uh, rapid fire, <laughs> suggestions on finding good contractors. I call four guys and no one shows up. Any suggestions? Uh, dangle the carrot, tell them you have a good renova a big renovation for them or whatever. I get guys to show up, just have a talk with them, you know, and, and be human and call more people then. Tell them you have lots of work for them in the future. You gotta dangle that carrot. That's a big one to get them out. Uh, what account should I save by not payment in TFSA, RSP, reg, savings account? So, Alinda, good question. I like the tax-free savings account. You can grow that money in there and then you can take it out when the time comes or whenever you need it. RSP, you can't take it out unless it's your first time home buyer. And even then there's stipulations to pay it back. I wouldn't save for a house in an RSP. I, if you have a TFSA room open, the tax-free savings account room open, I think it's like $55,000, $60,000. Right now, you can just load your money in there and anything you earn, if you buy some stocks or hold some 
you know, fixed instruments or bonds or whatever you're holding in there, at least all that is tax-free. I mean, you need the money you just take it out. So I would definitely hold it in there. What websites do you use to get data on vacancy rates, appreciation rates, et cetera, for different cities in Ontario? Uh, good question, CrowdJoy. I would just go on Google and grab some stuff from there. Immigration stuff, so like government websites. A lot of the Statistics Canada stuff um, is good. There are some Canadian real estate sites that will uh, aggregate the data for you so you can look at just the aggregated results. Jet Set Baroni says, how often do you raise rents? Do you charge slightly lower rent and maintain higher occupancy or charge max and deal with the turnover? I'd rather charge max and deal with the turnover. Um, I, yeah, that's, that's a quick answer to that. I'll go on a tangent if I don't. Hey Mike, do you ever get your new mentoree? Yeah, so we did. We got two, men, uh, two new mentees into the program. So really, really excited to have the two of them join us. Hey Mike, I'm considering building four townhouses on a plot of land around London. I want to use a builder's quote to get construction mortgage and then subtract the work myself. Thoughts? Angie Ferns. Uh, Angie, really good, uh, good question overall. I think that be careful being a developer. It takes way longer than you think it's going to. I actually am currently developing four lots onto like $4 million cottages which is outside of between Grand Band and Sarnia. It took me way longer than I thought. Very expensive. Things always go over budget. Just keep that in mind. I think being a builder is very, very risky behavior, especially going into a recession. There's no cash flow. Just be careful. Um, you could do that. You could do a draw mortgage for way more than what it actually costs. You have to get an appraiser to sign off on it. So yeah, theoretically, it'd be a great idea. Uh, thanks, Daniel, for the comment. appreciate that. Great advice, he says. William says, subscribe. YouTube will pop up when a, the notice shows up to go live. 100% true. Justin Ramakran, uh, Ramkaran says, would you recommend using your TFSA first, then RSP, or vice versa, or does it matter? TFSA always first. RSP only makes sense if you're in a high income earning period and you think you're going to be in a lower in earning income period when you withdraw because you pay tax on everything that you withdraw from your RSP. When you contribute to your RSP, you get a tax credit. So only contribute to your RSP in years of high earning. And you can withdraw from your RSP whenever you want. There's no age limit. You can withdraw from it next year when you're retired if you have no income and take that money out almost tax free. So that's something to think about. Uh, show me the money and do a push up. Okay, I'm gonna end with a push up. <coughs> Sorry guys, can we point this camera at the ground? And I'm gonna try not to knock any wires over or break anything. The setup's a little better now, isn't it? Me, Z, Z, don't invest in credit owned capital. <laughs> uh, top five places to invest in real estate in Ontario. Uh, London, Windsor, Oshawa, Niagara, Hamilton. Um, I think that's five. I don't even know. All right, push-up time. For all those people that heard that, you heard the markets that I'm going to be hitting. I just gave away my strategy. Yeah, I'm going to influence that market before I even get there. Okay, one push-up. Ah, I'm not going to do it with this suit jacket on. No sound anymore. When I said one, I meant like 50. You guys know that, right? Mike doesn't ever just do one. It's like, oh, just buy one property. Oh, just buy one business. Let's get a little warm up. What was that, guys? Like 44. Can you count it? Yep. <laughs> there. Should I do 10 more? I can't see the comments. Does anyone want me to do like one more? Motivate me to stay ripped, guys. Even when I'm sick. I might go on capital. Credit on capital has really low returns, honestly. Um, if I had a REIT fund, I'd say invest in that, but I don't have a REIT fund, so no bias. I have no fund. You can buy properties if you want, and I'll manage them. We take a small cut of upside. Okay, let's do some more here. Oh, my arms are burnt out. Let's try to go to like 75 if I have it in me. Oh, I'm so tired. Ugh. Oh, my arms are tired. What is that? 10, 11? That's 60. 
Got 15 more. Do I have it in me, guys? You can do it. The end reel. Is anyone still even watching? This is like the live workout at the end. I don't even know if I have the energy to put my shirt off after this. Oh. Ugh. Do five super slow diamondback or clappers. If I have it in me, I'll see. Nope. Oh, that killed me. No clappers. Alright, another clapper. Three more clappers. Oh, get in here. Just do it. Give it everything you've got. Diamond push up, guys. I haven't eaten hardly today. You're so. at like six. Come on. You got this. Six. Oh, yeah. Come on. Three more. Ugh. One of the mentees. Jonas. You can see him. Faster. Stronger. He's harder. hiding. You can't see him. He's blending in. That's 75. Yeah, that's really it, buddy. You did 10, guys. That wasn't 10. Yeah. Oh, you got, you got your abs back. Five. Yeah, I, I haven't eaten today. No hugging dogs. I had like one meal today. Alright, that's it. Let's end the stream. Cut it. Cut it. One minute. It's up cut to you, it. Man. It's up to you. Can we can we cut can we end the stream? How do I end the stream? Okay, there we go. End. Skip alert? No, I don't know. You bitch bag. How do I get out of the stream? Just do a soft one, right? Yeah, Start? You have to name. End stream. Yeah, Bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>